We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. What would our lives be like if we could be our authentic self? It's a great question, but it begs a couple more. How do we know if we're being our authentic self and how do we set off on the journey to find ourself? For a deep dive into this topic, my witness is Dr. Linda Berman, who's a writer, an artist and a retired psychoanalytical psychotherapist. Before her retirement, she worked both in the NHS as a principal psychotherapist and privately within a psychiatric hospital. She was also a counsellor and a supervisor with Relate for many years, for whom I worked for the first half of my career. Her weekly blog, which is called waysofthinking.co.uk, is about mental health, psychotherapy, life and relationships. So what do you mean by our authentic self, Linda? What I mean is it's important, I think, to be real, to try to be true to oneself. Authenticity in in this sense means being fair-minded, means being genuine, generous, just real. It's easy to say, but I guess it's harder to do. And I get from my clients all the time when they say, people always say, I have to be myself. What do you mean by being myself? Well, masks are very in the news at the moment. And the kind of masks I'm talking about are the masks that we tend to wear on a a daily basis. I guess we all do. This is about a kind of invisible protection against the fear of being discovered for who we really are. And that's really understandable. It's in some situations, I guess, inevitable that we're going to maybe at at an interview or in any kind of other social situation that we might put on some kind of way of being that isn't really ourselves. So give me a couple of examples of masks that you might wear in your daily life. Okay. Well, I think it's perhaps at a party or a a social gathering. Maybe sometimes I've gone and I've not felt absolutely over the moon or brilliant about things, but I'm at a party and one is supposed to be happy and jolly. And that's the kind of feeling that people might have. And so there's a kind of pretense. If I really acted externally as I felt internally, I would look very miserable because that might be how I feel. So I guess there are times when we all do put on masks. Do you think you might have a mask on at the moment? Oh, yes. (laughs) So tell me about the mask you're wearing at the moment. Well, my mask at the moment hides my anxiety. Obviously, I think I know what I'm talking about, but I'm trying to put on a mask that shows that I really do. (laughs) So all my self-doubts are hidden beneath my mask. (laughs) And in a sense, I've put on the mask of Andrew G. Marshall, who is a competent person who's going to guide us through this uh, event. I think it's really important to get something out of the way, that it's possible for our authentic self to be fragmented and contradictory. We don't have to be a consistent person. And I think when you start talking about the authentic self, and I'm thinking, what is my authentic self? I sort of want it to have one strand. You know, I want to be compassionate, open, understanding. But, you know, I'm also impatient. (laughs) I can be a bit judgy sometimes, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not necessarily always consistent. Am I right in thinking this? Absolutely. I mean, my authentic self and all of our authentic selves are a mass of contradictions, a mass of different kinds of feelings, behaviours, thoughts, intentions, some that we might fear we'd be judged for and maybe judge others 
for. Uh, I agree with you. It isn't just one strand that makes ourselves authentic. So let's talk a bit about you, if that's okay. When Mm -hmm. do you think you first actually got interested in the idea of who is my authentic self? I think I've always been interested in that idea, right from my early 20s. And certainly at university, my first degree was in English. And this might sound ridiculous, but it's what happened. The lecturer in English said that the dictionary reflects human behaviour and change. And if a word changes, then the dictionary will reflect that. And it isn't the absolute right kind of authority. And that was quite a revelation to me because as a child, I had always been told, go and look it up in the dictionary. (laughs) Did we have the same parents by any chance? Oh, okay. Yes, maybe we did. And this was a revelation at a young age. And it set me thinking that maybe I could have some authority. I could be who I really wanted to be and who I was. And that might sound obvious now, but, you know, as a, an innocent, relatively speaking, 18-year-old, it was mind-blowing. And it set me on my way to thinking about who am I and who is this authentic self? It's really one of the most important questions we can ask, who am I? What do you think was holding you back? Well, certainly the culture. I mean, I was born in 1949 and the culture was very much children should be seen and not heard. And if I said anything that went against the sort of general view in my family, I remember being told, oh, I see everybody in the army's out of step but you. (laughs) <laughs> we so, do have the same parents <laughs> so being auth- being authentic was frowned on I remember feeling like a plum tied to an apple tree and it felt that my view of the world was not acceptable and I had to fit in so being authentic just wasn't on the cards for me Almost from the very beginning, we're given the message to fit in. You you get a school report at the end of each term that basically says how well you've done in fitting in. I've actually got all my school reports. And it's quite sort of funny seeing over and over again things like he's only interested in certain topics, as if, you know, we have to be interested in absolutely everything. (laughs) Yeah, my first school report, age four, said, Linda can be boisterous. Well, I was never boisterous again after that. And I often think, you know, a lot of my therapy and my work on myself is to refine that early boisterousness that got kind of... um, Fat on. Yes, for whatever you'd like to say, (laughs) indeed. A lot of people come from families where they're not allowed to have certain feelings like sad, angry, different. Mm -hmm. And I often think that a good place to find your natural self, your authentic self, is to think of actually all the things you were not allowed to be. Yeah, that's that's really good. And I I guess it was, for me, the centre of my therapy experience, being who I wasn't allowed to be. And that was, well, yes, boisterous. (laughs) I wasn't allowed to swear, so there was a lot of swearing in my therapy. (laughs) And just generally being free to be who I knew I was, but nobody else seemed to know it. And when others don't reflect who you feel you are, that can be very confusing. And that, I think, has been part of the centre of my work, which is about having a kind of witness to who you are, which I didn't have. So let us understand a bit more about reflecting back Mm -hmm. or mirroring, which is also sometimes actually called. Why is it so important? It's important right from the start. I mean, Winnicott talks a lot about this and he talks about the mother, but I, I feel it can be mother, father, any good enough parent, looks into the new baby's eyes and that baby looks back at the parent. The baby needs to see reflected in the parent's eyes, him or herself, and not a reflection of the parent. 
sadly, in many cases, it's very difficult for some parents to actually see their child in terms of their whole self and, and who even the new baby is. But it's never too late to be mirrored. Absolutely not. I mean, that fits very well with, um, I don't know if you've heard of Cohut. Heinz so Cohut. tell me about Cohut. I've never heard of Cohut. Okay. Well, Cohut is kind of really important to me, not personally, but his theories of self-psychology. So his theories of self-psychology were about discovering who we were from our very earliest experiences of the people who are looking after us, taking care of us, whoever they are, and that we kind of integrate and internalise aspects of those carers, whoever they are, to hopefully make us feel confident and happy and good about ourselves. The reason I thought of him was, was what you said well, about be, it not being ever too late, because Cohut talks about carers and parents as being self-objects, which are others who can actually give us what we need in the world, whatever that might be, especially related to ourselves and our own development. And what he says is that it, throughout life, we discover new self-objects. So it's kind of never too late to find people who can inspire us, teach us about ourselves. And I find that very hopeful. And certainly I, uh, I can feel that many people along the way have been self-objects for me. So give me an example of somebody who's been a self-object for you. Yeah, well, my first therapist was my self-object that comes to mind. She really helped me over a number of years discover who I was and demonstrated in her behaviour how I might be. I learned from her so many things about life. Um, she was really somebody who inspired me and still does to this day. And it was a long time ago. In fact, she's dead now. <laughs> what about people who were not therapists? Did you have friends or a partner or a work colleague so that um, people who are not in therapy could potentially recognise some of these people around them? Absolutely. I think lecturers at university, friends, certainly, my husband. I think we've been self-objects for each other, really, in a long marriage. Yeah, I, I think we can discover people along the way in all kinds of settings. So let's imagine somebody has a significant other or a very good friend. How could they put this in a way that their partner would understand and they're not going to get terribly defensive about? How do you actually say, I'd like you to be a self-object for me, somebody who's going to mirror back? Well, I don't think I'd say it to anyone because I think it just happens. I can, you know, think through my life and think, oh, it happened with her. She was somebody who really influenced me. I think it kind of just evolves that we can think of people in our lives who really influence us. I'm not sure one can kind of consciously, well, I suppose you can consciously be a self-object for someone, but I, I don't think I'd want to ask anyone to do that. It needs to just happen. Now, unfortunately, some of the way that we define ourselves and try and get towards our authentic self. And I said that this can be useful, but it's also a bit of a full stop. We can actually rebel and it becomes about who we're not, which obviously, as I said, is a start, but it's not actually who we are. Mm -hmm. And that's very much a teenage sort of kind of thing, isn't it? We sort Absolutely. of say, I'm not going to be like my parents. Yes. But not being your father or not being your mother is still being imprinted on them rather than being your authentic self. So how do we get around that idea? Well, I, I'm interested in what one of your other witnesses, as you call them, said. Josh Cohen talked mm -hmm. about rebellion as being rebellion against the self. And I think that's, that's right. I, I think rebellion is often against something inside us that really is like the people that we're trying to rebel against. So there's a part of us that's kind of maybe judgy or critical that we really need to reach, actually looking at what inside us, actually, what part of us doesn't approve of us, what part of us is now 
judging us because often if we've been judged as children we kind of internalize that judgmental bit and use it on ourselves and often speak to ourselves internally in the way that perhaps we were spoken to as children and it's finding those messages that perhaps hamper our journey towards being authentic and perhaps be a little bit kinder to our judgmental voice indeed indeed i always to try when i was working because i'm retired now try to help people look at the internal voices which often did repeat you know the message i mean i i repeated many times the message oh you're the only one in the army who's in step uh, even to this day as i say something that feels really different or original i think oh should i say this dare i say it and that's that bit inside me that's you know critical of me now i love a poem that you shared that i'm going to share and then perhaps you'd like to talk about it it's called not and it's by erin hansen you are not your age nor the size of clothes you wear you are not a weight or the color of your hair you are not your name or the dimples in your cheek you are all the books you read and all the words you speak you are your croaky morning voice and the smiles you try to hide. You're the sweetness in your laughter and every tear you've cried. You're the songs you sing so loudly when you know you're all alone. You're the places that you've been to and the one that you call home. You're the things that you believe in and the people whom you love. You're the photos in your bedroom and the future you dream of. You've made so much of beauty and it seems that you forgot when you decided that you were defined by all the things you're not. Why did that poem speak to you, Linda? Mm. Well, it feels very much about authenticity. I think today, especially, there's a great pressure to look acceptable to whatever fashion is around. And I think the internet doesn't help with that. So to be very conscious of one's weight, one's size, one's hair colour or whatever, not just for women, but men as well. And not to actually realise that these are external superficialities. These are about only appearance. And, and whilst they do have meaning, they are not what is authentic and real. And I guess the poem really hit the spot because it is all about being who we really are, even if that doesn't feel socially acceptable. And it seems to be an awful lot about what you're doing in private as well. That, you know, when nobody's listening and you're singing in the shower, when we're unwatched, there is a perhaps more of an access to ourselves, do you think? Well, indeed. And I think this is where it kind of um, is talking about the human condition and the shared humanity in us all. We don't generally talk about singing in the shower, but we know that most of us do it or, or similar. It's about getting to who we really are rather than the kind of superficialities. And do you think you've reached who you really are? I try and it's not always possible, but I guess we never do reach who we really are, but we arrive at various points along the way. Do you think retiring helped? Because one of the masks that we wear the most is the professional mask, yeah, isn't it? indeed. I feel like I internalised a lot of what being a psychotherapist meant. So I, I kind of still feel I'm a psychotherapist, even though I'm not practising. It doesn't feel like a mask. It feels like a part of me. And that feels quite satisfying. I kind of transformed uh, what I did into writing and especially writing the blog. So it does feel authentic. Was it a hard transition giving up something that is uh, very much a key part of your authentic self professionally? I don't feel I've given it up because I'm still kind of in the psychotherapy world inside. Giving up working, I miss very much the team that I was part of in the NHS. And I missed seeing people in therapy, patients, clients. I did miss that. But I was tired and ready, ready to actually gather together everything that I'd done, uh, psychotherapy, art, 
writing and somehow put it in some kind of form that um, would bring together all the strands of my life working on. Because I'm sort of hearing that our authentic self is a, an evolving authentic self. Absolutely. That your authentic self today is different from your authentic self maybe 20, 30 years ago. Very different. I can see that I have evolved, that I am somewhat more confident, and that my interests have developed. They're still interesting. It's the same interests that I had as a teenager, but they've developed and moved and and matured, I suppose, somewhat. Now, this is a difficult question that I've been thinking about. Can we have multiple authentic selves? You know, I'm thinking of the Walt Whitman sort of idea, the American poet, I am large, I contain multitudes. Could we have several authentic selves or am I just making it too complicated? <laughs> well, I think the importance is that, yeah, I guess we do have different aspects of ourselves. I think the important thing in that is to work at integrating them. It would be quite problematical if we had authentic identities that were kind of split off from each other. So I guess what we need to do is is look at who we are and try and bring it all together in, into a kind of integrated whole, which is hopefully what I've tried to do with my work and my interests in, in, in the blog. Linda and I together have come up with seven ways to discover your values and feelings. But before we move on to that, I'm sort of wondering if an idea from Carl Rogers, who's the father of person-centred therapy, is a useful concept for us here, which is congruence. So perhaps you can explain what congruence is and how it fits in with finding our authentic self. I think congruence is a very useful term as you say, coined in this meaning by Carl Rogers. It is about realness. And I've heard a quote, I can't remember who it was from now, but who said that congruence is about being the same behind closed doors as you are outside. Now, that's really quite difficult, isn't it, for us to be our real authentic selves out there. But being congruent as a therapist is really important because I'm not saying one should disclose everything about singing in the shower, but that it is important to be on centre as a therapist so that you can really examine your feelings, your thoughts and your responses to the other person in an honest way without it being muddied by one's own issues. And in a sense, that's something we want to try, not just us therapists, but yes. us human beings. Indeed. We sort of want to try and take all of our stuff out of when we're communicating with somebody. And I'm just wondering how that would look like. Yeah. I mean, I guess in relationships, in marriage, it's quite difficult, isn't it, to actually relate to the other in a clear way. A way without strings, a clean way, I'd yeah. say. You yes. know, if you love me, then you will do X, Y, Z, you know, you'll take yeah. the rubbish out sort of kind of, <laughs> yes, kind of thing. It is <laughs> that, you know, we love somebody if they fulfill what we want from them. Our love sometimes is not particularly clean and our reactions can sometimes be more about ourselves than the other person. Oh, indeed. And um, the journalist Janet Malcolm said rather pessimistically, we cannot see each other clear and well maybe she's right but I guess there are degrees of that and the way we speak or relate to our spouse our children our friends needs to be examined from time to time to see whether we are relating manipulatively so you're talking about the rubbish if you love me I'll take the rubbish out or, or, or whether we're being as clear as clean as you say as we possibly can not easy it, part of the human condition, isn't it? Let's look at the seven ideas of ways to discover your own values and feelings rather than still being programmed by your parents who, in your case and one of my case, died quite a few years ago. And there's nothing worse than still trying to please people who are no longer here to be pleased. The first thing you've got as a way to discover your own values and feelings is self-reflection. Now, what do you mean by self-reflection? 
Well, it's a little like I was talking about in terms of relating to others, that I guess there are important times when we need to look at ourselves. Not easy. And that could be done on one's own, with books, with other people, through therapy. But something about examining oneself and how we relate to others, how we function in the world, how we relate to ourselves. Do we give ourselves constant critical messages or are we encouraging to ourselves? It feels like self-reflection is important. And I have uh, clients who sort of set aside a bit of time, you know, at some point during the week, and they will reflect just by writing in a sort of journal, sometimes about particular questions. You know, for example, if you are somebody who does that, the question might be, how authentic to myself have I been this week? And you could examine that, that would be sort of self-reflection. And I think it actually really helps to get some words onto paper because that gives you a little bit more distance from your your thoughts yeah. and your feelings. So, Indeed. But self-reflection is very important. Now, the next thing we've decided to look at is feedback. Now, what do you mean by feedback? What I mean by feedback is allowing ourselves to listen to others views of us, to others' feelings about us, thoughts about us, feedback about who we're perceived as. I mean, obviously, that's going to be subjective, isn't it? But I guess if we constantly hear from several people that we are, for example, critical, then maybe we have to think about that. Taking on board just as much as might help us discover how we are. Yes. My partner is often saying to me, my first response is no. <laughs> And then I work yeah. through to yes, and that probably is not a very helpful thing to do. Now, the natural thing is to say, oh, no, 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 I don't say that. But I think it's useful to actually use that feedback. I mean, it can be helpful for someone who constantly is, is a pleaser, people pleaser, to practice in your head saying no first. But I, I get what you're saying, that uh, sometimes that might be a recurring pattern that is yes. examining. Let's have... A good friend, do you think you can actually say, How do you see me? I'm trying to get some sense of who my authentic self is. You know, here am I looking out. What's your view looking in, so to speak, or looking at? Do you think that is an okay thing to do? I, I, I think it's more than okay. I think it's very recommendable and something that uh, I do frequently. <laughs> the hope is that the friend would be a good enough friend to be able to give you some feedback that isn't always positive. And it's, it's hoped that one can find a friend like that or and a spouse. Maybe give them permission as well to say, yeah. you know, you can give me some negatives as well as the positives. Absolutely. So the third way to discover your own f values and feelings, you're not going to be surprised to hear this because we've got two therapists talking together, but <laughs> therapy is incredibly important. And I've just started psychoanalytical psychotherapy as a client for the first time ever. Uh, one of the great advantages of the German system where I live is you can get that on your insurance. And I'm just amazed at how much I've been discovering about myself, despite a lifetime of studying, that outside eye is really important. Why do you think therapy is so good at helping us find our own values and feelings rather than actually just wholesale taking on the therapist's values and feelings? Well, it needs not to be about taking on the therapist's values and feelings, obviously. I don't think therapy is for everyone. I think we might need to say this, that not everybody can feel that therapy is right for them or the kind of therapy that they're doing is right for them. It isn't a cure-all, but it can be very helpful and very useful for someone who finds it so and who perhaps can think psychologically and respond in a way that means they become more enlightened. I think it's helpful. I can talk about other kinds of therapies because I have dipped in and had some therapy in other models. But for me, psychological psychotherapy has helped me because of the links with the past. It, it has explained for me why issues from my past have still been with me and influencing my life in a way that really I was unaware of at the time. 
So knowing, for example, the impact of that first report that Linda is boisterous, that is really important. Yeah, it was a main theme in my therapy. Where had my boisterousness gone? Because I ended up a, a shy, depressed teenager. And, you know, the boisterousness had been flattened, but it's, it wasn't destroyed. It's still there. Because one of the questions I sometimes ask is, what did you give up moving from being a child to an adult that you might actually need still to go back and reclaim? And, you know, Mm. for you, that would be boisterous, but for other people, it's going to be different things. But I mean, it's a good question to ask yourself, what did I give up as a child? You know, when we say we put aside childish things to become an adult, what did you give up? I think a lot of people give up imagination, for example. Absolutely. And, you know, it's okay to draw when you're a child, but, you know, when you're our age, drawing, well, it's just a bit of, you know, a bit of a waste of time. But we'll come on to that in a second because it's not. And I think we're moving into the fourth idea, which is understanding the past and the impact on the present. Can really what happened when we were four still be with us? when we're, let me guess, 72? Uh, Yes, you guessed right. Yeah, it's still with me. A lot of it's hopefully been worked through, but I still can feel that shy child inside. I still can feel the uh, kind of critic inside saying, don't show your feelings, don't let yourself go too much. And, you know, I have to actually struggle with that sometimes. Less so now because I've worked on it long and hard and I have a husband who's helped me, who is quite boisterous actually, who's helped me, (laughs) who's helped me get in touch with my own boisterousness. It's amazing how we choose people. We don't actually think, oh, I fancy uh, somebody to spend the rest of my life with who's boisterous, (laughs) but somehow something deep inside us actually knows what it is we need. Absolutely. I guess we are often attracted to what is repressed inside ourselves. And um, I can certainly see that my husband expressed for me what I couldn't. Anger, boisterousness. I mean, I often say if he, if he were a dog, because he loves dogs, he'd be a spaniel because <laughs> he's so friendly. <laughs> and what do you think he's got from you? Ooh, I have to ask him that. I think what he's got from me is um, some psychological thinking, because he then trained as a group analyst. He's got the ability perhaps to think things out more analytically through me. And um, I was going to say thoughts on this. Yeah. I mean, and we've sort of given away the next of the the things, which is reading widely and learning from others. Mm -hmm. So we've learnt from others, as in our partner, reading widely. So tell me about that. Mm -hmm. Well, my first degree was, as I said, in English. And so reading for me is something that I have always done in a way that's been a kind of perhaps escape as a child, but it's been a way to understand people. And as I say, my first study was English, but really focusing on language and literature was a way into becoming a psychotherapist. And the reading widely, I think we'll just go back to one of my Mm. other witnesses, Josh Cohen, which is what he's saying is by reading widely, we can actually enter into the lives of other people. So at the moment, I'm currently reading, have you read Hamnet? So Hamnet is imagining the life of Shakespeare, who actually had a child called Hamnet, who died. And then he wrote, of course, Hamlet. And it's sort of putting that connection through. So I'm at the moment, deeply in another time, very much in the mind of his wife. And so, you know, I'm entering into somebody from another time as a different gender, and an entirely different way of looking at the world. And that actually, in a sense, I know it sounds weird, but I think I do learn more about what it is to be human. And through that, I learn more about myself. Yes, I think that's a really important point. I agree with you entirely. And I, 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 one of the things that's kind of surprised me 
in terms of my retirement and my work is that I'm focusing a lot on quotes, especially quotations from the past. And it's almost a kind of therapy for me because I'm seeing the world through reading quotes, through lots of different people's eyes, philosophers, writers, therapists, and often finding quotes on the same subject. And I find that if I have an issue, I can often find a quotation to think about that's really helpful. So I would agree that obviously reading books is really important, but for me, it's kind of metamorphosized into quotations. And so you could use the quotation as a, an avenue for self-reflection. Indeed. Could you give us an example of a quotation? Mm, yes, let's just have a look. I think there's a lot of quotations about the uncertainty of life that helped me, especially during lockdown. A lot of Yalom's interpretations, really. Irving Yalom, who's a psychotherapist, have really helped me. So I could read one of those. Uh, indeed, the capacity to tolerate uncertainty is a prerequisite for the profession. Though the public may believe that therapists guide patients systematically and sure-handedly through predictable stages of therapy to a foreknown goal, such is rarely the case. Indeed, instead, as these stories bear witness, therapists frequently wobble, improvise and grope for direction. The powerful temptation to achieve certainty through embracing an ideological school and a tight therapeutic system is treacherous. Such belief may block the uncertain and spontaneous encounter necessary for effective therapy. So the wobbles are actually necessary. Indeed, the wobbles are very necessary. I think those people in life and in therapy who feel they have a very clear, rigid road, often are the people who struggle because they're not flexible. So we're going through how to discover your own values and feelings. We've so far had self-reflection, feedback, therapy, understanding the past and the impact on the present, reading widely and learning from others. And the next one is being creative, that actually being creative ourselves, the writing, this is how I think, this is what I believe. And images are very useful. So you, on your website, use a lot of images. Why do you find images helpful for finding your own values and feelings? Well, after I retired, I did a fine arts degree because I'd always wanted to do that. That was part of my authentic self. I was encouraged to paint as a child, but I didn't think I wasn't kind of encouraged to do, maybe this is unfair, maybe it was my choice actually, to do English rather than art. But art was something that I wished I had studied. And I used lots and lots of images with patients that I had in therapy. Often I did some art therapy with them and often they brought photographs, for example, into the session. And why are images so powerful? Well, I think they kind of reach your guts in a way that words sometimes don't. For example, if a patient had lost someone, they would often bring me a photograph to show me who they were. And looking at that photograph would stir something really deep that perhaps couldn't be done so effectively in any other way. So the seventh way that you can discover your own values and feelings, we have put as a regular practice that turns into a habit. Why is it important to do this on a regular basis? Well, I guess there are things we can kind of build into our daily life. I guess it's important to allow ourselves time out, to reflect, to look at the world around us and not kind of rush through life not noticing, and, I, and I've written some blog posts about that, to, to, to stand and, and stare, because most of us don't have time to smell the roses. Mixed metaphor there, but yeah. Uh, and, and I guess a couple of times a day, one might stop and do whatever feels right. Stand and stare, yoga, meditation, painting, whatever, playing a musical instrument, whatever makes one feel more in touch with the self and the world. And it might not be something that seems, on the face of it, a way of discovering your values and feelings, but I've found being in a book group has been really helpful because you end up reading other 
people's books, you know, books you wouldn't read yourself. And that opens you up to new things. And seeing how other people respond to the same book and having a debate about it, that helps you understand your values and feelings much more than just reading it. Oh, I've got to the end of it. What am I going to read next? I think it's a case of finding ways of taking this into being more reflective and being reflective helps you find your authentic self. So what yeah. happens when we do become our authentic self then, Linda? Well, I mean, it's hard to generalise there, but I guess usually people who are their authentic selves come over as more likeable, more honest, people who perhaps we can identify with because they are talking about something that we understand and, and relate to because they're being real. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. One of the advantages of becoming a member of our supporters circle is you can write into us and I will discuss your letter with one of my witnesses. And at higher levels of support, there's all sorts of extra benefits as well. You also get to hear the three things that my guest knows to be true and to hear everything in the recording. So this is the letter I have for Linda and I to talk about today. My husband is in his early 50s and I'm in my late 40s. Our children are 21 and 22. They're so great and done so well, but we've given our lives to them and forgotten to look after ourselves. My husband was secretly trying to get over the feelings of loss and guilt he felt for his affair partner. 18 months of immense pain, tears, heartache, nervous breakdown were at the point where he is leaving for the fifth time. The difference now, he's finally been able to talk to me about feelings. Both felt controlled in the marriage. I've walked on eggshells and my husband has not felt heard about many topics, but sex in particular. We've had marriage counselling and both individual counselling. I've learnt we're both codependent and have felt enmeshed. Both our families are divorced and took so much from us also. He needs space to try and woo the affair partner. She's been a light which has not dimmed, even though he does not want her. She's 41 with two young children. It means he cannot retire early and we'll have to sell our lovely home that we've worked so hard for. We've been married for 25 years this year and both so wanted to be together and have travel adventures. We do so much together, sea, swim, cycle, run, but I think I really have lost him this time. I'm struggling to let him go. I've been respectful and said I will support his needs. We love each other so much, but are both so broken and tired. So, what were your thoughts when you read this, Linda? Well, I guess it's important that they, that she says that we love each other and also that they have been looking forward to the future together, to do all the things that they love, both of them. So they've got lots of shared interests. So there is both love and hope here. Having said that, his affair and his constant leaving are obviously very distressing and difficult for both. I would wonder what is the function of his affair for the whole marriage? Because when I have seen couples, I have wanted to work, if possible, psychoanalytically and to look at the marriage as a whole entity, not two separate people, even though they are two separate people, but the marriage itself is a whole, a whole entity, as I've said. And I wonder what that affair is doing for both. And I suggest that it's doing something similar. I suggest that it's actually, she talks about it as a light. And I think it may be a light for both, even though it must be awful for her. But actually, in this marriage, they haven't let much life light in. This marriage feels full of difficulty, hard work, no sex, control. There's not a lot of light or joy 
in the marriage except love and hope. What's not in it is sex. And I wonder whether, well, I think there is a big split between sex and love, that, that marriage is about love and maybe planning things together, but it's not about sex and excitement. It doesn't sound very exciting at all. So what's happened to the excitement and the sex? And what is it about these two that can't get sex and love together, but the sex has to be projected out into an affair? Because he doesn't want the other woman, is what she says, which is really curious. It is very curious, isn't it? He doesn't like her particularly, (laughs) doesn't particularly want to be living with her two small children, which you can understand once you've finally parceling your own off, moving in with other small children doesn't sound particularly jolly. That's the key though, isn't it? Because if, I guess, he did, he would recreate with the other woman the same daily grind. I'll probably have to go on and have one of them or other have another affair because there is a, a way of conceptualising marriage for both of them that is about, as I've said, the daily grind and no sex. So, I mean, it begs the question, how do we have sex and love together? Hmm. Well, I guess that's what it needs working on because if I were the therapist, it would be about resolving this split and looking at where it may have come from, the split in terms of sex and love. And I, I imagine that if, if we had both partners there, which might be an idea, we could examine how they have got this idea of marriage as a kind of very, as kind of boring hard work. And focused on the children rather than actually seeing each other. Absolutely. Yeah, that is another uh, and, and, I, and I guess those are going to be patterns for both of them in their past, because we all go into marriage with an idea of it, of how it should be, which I guess we've got from our parents' marriage, from the media, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I'd want to help them look at how it can be. But there's a great temptation to think we can be our authentic self with somebody else, that somehow our partner is stopping us from being our authentic self and this person down the road is going to allow us a fresh start where we can be our authentic self. I mean, it sounds quite a possible idea when I say it, but I'm playing a bit devil's advocate. Why might I not find my authentic self with the person down the road? Well, you might. I mean, it may be that that it's, it's right for that person. Having said that, I do feel that before one embarks upon something as drastic as leaving and restarting a relationship, another one, that examining one's part in the marital breakdown is, is helpful so that because people do repeat patterns. And in order to change something, I guess we need to understand it. And just changing without understanding is probably going to mean that we're going to take all of our problems down the road with us. It does indeed. We're going to still be the same same old person, probably just poorer. (laughs) Yeah, and unconsciously we'll find someone who's going to repeat the same patterns with us. And it may be that this time they can be worked on and worked through, but um, it might be a pity not to work on it the first time. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for being a witness on The Meaningful Life. We have to ask you as a witness, what makes your life meaningful, Linda? For me, I say, first of all, relationships with my husband, my children, and my grandchildren. I really enjoy the company of my grandchildren and and they make my life meaningful. There's a sense of continuity there that that, that feels important and good. What is the difference between having children and having grandchildren? Well, for me, I can only speak personally, but I have more time and probably more patience. I'm less stressed than I was when, and I'm not working, so I have more thinking time. I don't want to be their parent because that would be too much for me now, but I can spend just enough time for me and for them to make a relationship that feels constructive and and good for both of us, hopefully. 
So anything beyond relationships yes. that make your life meaningful? Obviously friends as well, you know, friends who feel close and understanding. But what came to mind was Freud's What Makes a Happy Person, which is to love and to work. And even though I'm retired, I still consider I'm, I'm working, although I've uh, kind of changed my work. And it's taken many forms over the years. So for me, writing, painting, writing my blog, a possible new book. And um, I also love cooking and feeding people. I would like to see what food would be served if I came round to your house. <laughs> and hopefully one day we'll be able to sit round a kitchen table together. I hope so. That would be lovely. Thank you for being a witness today. Now, the conversation doesn't end here if you're a member of our supporters circle. And here's some details about how you can find out more about becoming a supporter of this podcast. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Collick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.